Let me invite you to take your Bibles this morning and turn to Psalm 1. We'll be looking at that today. Psalm 1. And uh, while you're finding that passage, in whatever way you have God's Word with you today, uh, let me express my appreciation to you as a church family. It's great to be back again with you. Uh, uh, Six of us from our church uh, spent a week serving the Lord in the town of San Juan de los Lleras, Cuba. And I want to thank you for your prayers and for your encouragement and also just the provision that you have made as a church family for church members and staff to serve the Lord on mission. We want to be a church that not only gives to missions and prays for missions, but we want want to be a church that goes on mission as the Lord calls and as the Lord leads. We had a great uh, week, um, and and here is our group, and you'll notice uh, the the, uh, the faces here, and and many of these were at the 9 o'clock service as well. We've got Ed Pavey, myself, of course David Johnson there on the back, Susan Blevins and Corey Richardson and Dan Flanagan, and standing in the middle uh, are the pastor and his wife of the Iglesia Bautista de San Juan de los Lleras. Uh, This would be Pastor Olivier and his wife, Anna. Uh, While we were there, we were able to videotape a greeting from the pastor back to us. We want to show you that video right now. And standing next to the pastor uh, is our translator for the week, a young man by the name of Guillermo. And when a group of us went to Guanahai, Cuba back in September, Guillermo was our translator for that trip as well. So it's great to see uh, some familiar faces. And as the Lord leads for the future of our partnership with missions in Cuba, it's great to know that we've got a network of folks uh, that we can connect with each time that we serve. So listen now to a greeting from the pastor of the uh, Baptist Church in San Juan de los Lleras. Hola, mi nombre es Livier Colín y agradezco a Dios la oportunidad de tener esta semana este grupo de hermanos. Hello, my name is Livier and I really appreciate the opportunity for this week to have this group of brothers. Ellos nos han bendecido con la palabra de Dios. They have blessed us with God's word y su tiempo de amor entre nosotros. And their time of love among us. Reciban el cariño de toda nuestra iglesia. Receive the love of all our church. Y el agradecimiento por su gentileza. And the appreciation for all of your kindness. A través de estos hermanos. Through these brothers. Por sus ofrendas de amor. For your offerings of love. Y sus estímulos de cariño. And your caring encouragement. Dios les bendiga. May God bless you. Serving there in Cuba for the week, there was one particular moment when I happened to look up into the night sky, and some some thoughts and memories began uh, just to overwhelm me at that point as I was thinking back about Sarah and the kids and you and, and how much we all missed being with you last week, but again, how good and faithful the Lord was while we were serving there. But Something came into my heart and mind as I particularly saw the moon and the stars one particular night serving there in Cuba. And what was brought to my mind was a song that was very special to Sarah and I when we were dating back in college. Now, many of you as couples, maybe there's a song that was popular back when you were dating. And, and so, it were, I mean, Sarah and I have been married for 30 years. And as long as we've been married, whenever that song comes on the radio, if it streams through Pandora or Spotify or, or however we listen to music nowadays, whenever we hear that song, both of us will kind of look at each other and smile because not only was that song popular when we were dating, but it's just, it's got a very special place in our hearts because it expresses so much in music the love that we had for each other then and the love that we continue to have for each other uh, again as our love grows stronger as a couple, as a marriage, and as a family. You might be wondering what the song was, and I don't mind to share it with you even though it, it dates me just a little bit. Some of you might remember this. It was a song by James Ingram and Linda Ronstadt, the duet they did, um, somewhere out there uh, beyond the clear blue sky, there's someone thinking of me. Remember that song? Uh, it was, I think it was from a, a cartoon, An American Tale. 
right, with the, the, the mouse that came over on the immigrant boat and all that stuff. But at some point, as he is missing his family back home, he sees the moon and stars in the sky, and then there's a, there's a picture of his family back home, and they see the very same moon and stars in the sky, and then the song begins to sing. So, yeah, that, I mean, that's like our song, right? James, in- James Ingram, Linda Ronstadt, somewhere out there, someone is thinking of me. A song that expresses the love that we have for each other um, in, in a way far more than, than I could even put into words myself. There is something about songs, something about music, and they can hook into our hearts, and they really do express so well love and feeling and emotion and longing and memory as well. The reason I shared that story with you is I want to show you some things from Psalm 1 this morning. And again, hopefully you've had time to find it in your Bible, Psalm 1. Psalm 1 is not only just an amazing chapter from Scripture, and even from the first service this morning, had several people come up to me afterwards and say, Pastor Mike, Psalm 1 is one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture. I mean, we just love it. But Psalm 1 also acts as an introduction, kind of an opening song, if you will, to an entire collection of music because the book of Psalms, in my opinion, is music. It's the hymnal of the Bible. It is men and women expressing feelings and emotions and experiences experiences back up to God in worship. And as you scan through the book of Psalms, you find some Psalms that are full of celebration and thanksgiving thankfulness and joy and gratitude, but then you find other psalms that are full of of, of pain and and anguish and and disappointment, being very honest with God. You also find, find psalms of celebration, psalms of gratitude, psalms that lift up the Lord as king, psalms that lift up God in his power. These are songs. These are songs that express what it means to be in relationship with God, even to be in love with God. They're love songs that you and I can express to God. It's a treasure. Love the book of Psalms. Psalm 1 kicks the whole thing off. Psalm 1 is the opening cut on the album, if you will. And even though we listen to music in so many different ways now than we used to, the power of songs has not gone away. The power of the book of Psalms has even grown stronger as the body of Christ worships together under the lordship and kingship of Jesus himself. Look at Psalm 1, and let's, let's see what the Lord has for us today. Psalm 1, please stand in honor of God's word. Follow along as I read aloud. Beloved chapter of scripture, and in fact, the opening cut for this album of love songs to the Lord. Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. If, if I were to think of a title for this song, this is the title that I would give it to. Blessed is the one. Blessed is the one. Now, depending on your Bible translation, mine says in verse 1, blessed is the man. But again, this applies to anyone, man, woman, boy, or girl, anyone who is in relationship with the Lord, anyone who even today is in love with the Lord. This one is blessed. If you are loving the Lord Jesus this morning, you are blessed. The word for blessed means, yes, to be happy. It means to be full of joy. It means to be full of peace and promise. It means to be satisfied in the Lord. Yeah, it just means to be blessed. We live in a day and a culture searching for all ways to be happy and blessed and satisfied. And any way outside of the Lord Jesus Christ is going to end in futility. But in love with the Lord, we are blessed. So think of the title of this song, Blessed is the One. What does this relationship with the Lord look like? 
Psalm 1 simply says this. It, it lines it out so clearly and so basically and, and so simply. The best thing I can do is simply show you how this psalm describes it. Like any good love psalm, it brings you into the story and it says this is what it's like to be in love. This is what it means to be in love with the Lord. If you're longing for this kind of life, if you just long to be blessed in God, if you long to have a life not free of pain or disappointment, but just a life of basic peace and joy in the Lord, and if you're thinking, where can I get this? Where can I find this? See what Psalm 1 has to show you. First of all, it means this. If you're going to have a relationship with God, this song says the first thing that you are to do is to decide for him. Like any relationship, if you're going to be in love with the Lord Jesus Christ, you have to decide for him. A relationship with God is not some sort of a passive thing where you just kind of wait for it to happen to you or maybe you see it happening to other people and you hope that maybe a little bit of it gets over on you. Or maybe you think about important influential people in your life, maybe a mom or a dad or some grandparents, and you know that they have been praying for you. You know they certainly are godly and walking with the Lord, and you're thinking, you know, maybe that'll just be good enough. It's not. Because God loves you, he wants to be in a direct, intimate, personal relationship with you. But because he loves you and because he respects you, this is not something that he will force on you, and it's not something that will happen without your action. He will lay this out for you. And listen, if you're getting any inkling of what this psalm is talking about, it means the Holy Spirit is opening up your heart to understand this. But you must decide. You must take action to say, God, I'm with you. I want to be in relationship with you. It takes action. Psalm 1, look at what it says. Blessed is the man, look at the action here, who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. This is someone who just says, you know what, I'm no longer content with my life the way that it is. I'm letting culture call the tune. I'm letting others decide how I live and what's important to me. It's a person who says, I am deciding now to be in God and with him. I'm no longer going to walk in the counsel of the wicked. I'm no longer going to go in their path or in their way. And I'm certainly not going to stop in, in the way of sinners. I, it's, it's not just a question now of walking. It's now of standing still, standing put to where it begins to have an effect upon you. But then notice toward the end of verse 1. Nor sits in the seat of scoffers. A scoffer is someone who blasphemes God. A scoffer is someone who, is, who makes fun of, of people trying to follow the Lord. A scoffer is someone who says, well, if God is just, if God is love, then, then why do all things happen? But listen, not asking with honesty, not asking with, with, with transparency, but asking in a mocking, skeptical way, as if, in other words, their mind is already made up, but they, they, they jide and cheer and mock those who are trying to follow God. And the truth is, if you and I aren't careful and if we don't make a decision, we will find ourselves walking in their ways, sitting with them, even planting down our roots with them. And if you don't take any action whatsoever, this will be your life. Because this is our world, this is our culture, and this is our fallenness as men and women. We have to decide to take a stand for the Lord and decide for him. This is where it begins. Now, the New Testament is clear. Jesus Christ came to give us life. He came to die for our sins and rise from the grave. Jesus himself says, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. The wise man builds his house upon the rock. The foolish man builds it upon the sand. Decide for Jesus, but you must decide. No one can do this for you, but this is how it begins. You decide for him. But then secondly, notice this. It also means that you delight in him. And like any relationship, you decide that you want to enter into a relationship, maybe with someone who one day will become a husband or a wife. But notice this. In the Lord Jesus, not only do you decide for him, but you also choose to delight in him. What brings you joy? What brings you the most happiness? What do you get most excited about? What do you look most forward to? Well, look at verse 2. 
For the person in relationship with God, this song says, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. We've got a stereotype that says, well, th this sounds like somebody who's so much into the law, so much into the rules and, and the commandments and the thou shalts and thou, thou shalt nots. This is the someone who, who is, is kind of maybe even has a sour look on their face and they're kind of looking around for other people who just quite aren't as holy as they are. If that's our impression of what this is about, it's, it's wrong. It's tragically wrong. No, no, this is someone who is delighted. This is someone with joy and a smile and laughter in their lives. Why? Because they're letting God reveal himself to them. How does God reveal himself? How do you get to know God better? How does God reveal himself? Does he reveal himself in nature? Sure he does. Does he reveal himself through the body of Christ? Certainly he does. Does he reveal himself sometimes to us in dreams and in the impressions of the heart? Certainly he does all those things. But the surest, most trustworthy way for God to reveal himself is through this word. This eternal, inerrant, authoritative word. The word that does not change. And when the psalm says, upon his law, he meditates, the word for law is the Hebrew word Torah, which can also mean instruction or teaching or even word. It's simply saying, you know, this is where I find out what God is like. It's in the word that I find out that God is full of mercy. He is full of grace. He will not chide forever. It's in this word that I find out that mourning may endure for a time, but joy comes in the morning. The word tells me that. The word tells me that I'm desperate and that I'm needy. The word tells me that Jesus Christ is God the Son, and 2,000 years ago he gave his life for me and he rose again from the dead. I wasn't there to see it, but the Word tells me. And this is where we find our delight. Just as you delight in spending time with people that you love and they lift your spirits, how much more is it, is it so that when we spend our time communing with the Lord, we let his uner His unending, inerrant word guide us into all truth, and we find the delight and the quickening of our spirit that's there. And if we think that reading the Bible is drudgery, or that reading God's word is something that we just have to do, not because we want to, then we've completely missed it. In relationship with God, his word gives you delight, and see if that's not true for you too. Decide for him. Delight in him. And what else do we do? We also depend on him. I love the picture that Psalm 1 paints of the person in good, full, vital relationship with the Lord. Look at verse 3. He is like a tree planted by the streams of water, yields its fruit in its season, leaf doesn't wither, and in all that he does, he prospers. I love this picture. Because of all the ways that the Bible has of describing a life fully blessed in the Lord, that of a tree is one of many ways to do it. But I, right now I can't think of a more effective picture to have in mind. Picture that strong tree, the mighty tree, and picture it in full leaf so that it has fruit, full leaves providing shade and beauty, lifting the spirits of people around. This is a beautiful picture of a life blessed in God. But for this particular tree, it's got to be close to water. It's got to be right next to it. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Any tree needs water. There are trees that can grow in, in what seems like the most driest and desolate of climates, and yet they do find a way to grow. This is how God has created them. Think about a desert plants. They find water. They're, either their roots go down deep enough or they draw it from the moist air. They find water, even though there's no stream nearby. Folks, that's not the tree described here. This is a tree where if it's not close to water, it will wither up and die. And you have to understand that in your life with God, in relationship with him, you've got to be close to the water. Don't picture yourself as that, as that desolate plant out there by itself, clinging to some rocky mountainside somewhere. That's not you. No, you've got to be right there at the water. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Jesus said, I am the water. 
Jesus said to the Samaritan woman at the well, he said, listen, if you trust in me, you're going to find a spring, a fountain of living water that never ends, and it will give life and refreshment and joy to your very soul. But you got to tap into it. That's you and that's me. And you know, maybe it might be okay. Maybe. I'm, let, let, me, let me be careful how I say this. Maybe it would be okay if someone could brag and say, you know what, I, I'm just such a strong Christian. I just don't need other people. I don't need a church family. I don't need to be in Bible study. I just don't need a whole lot because I can just do it on my own. Not true. Not real. Listen, if someone tells you that they can be a Christian on their own and they're doing just fine all by themselves, no church family, no connection, no encouragement, no accountability, they are lying to you. Because the Bible clearly says that we've got to be dependent on God for everything. And why would Jesus, why would Jesus in the Beatitudes say, blessed are those who are poor in spirit? Why would he say that? Why would he say you are most blessed when you're poor in spirit? We might say, well, wouldn't we be blessed if we are abounding in spirit? Understand what Jesus means. When you realize how dependent you are, when you realize how desperate you are for the Lord and everything good comes from him, and if God were even for a split second to, to, to somehow stop or cease his blessing or his watch care, if he were to do it for just a moment, then you would say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's how dependent we are on him. And that's life lived in relationship. Can you be a strong tree? Yep. Abounding in fruit, a blessing, shade, strong. Yes, you can be. And yes, you are. But you've got to be close to the water. Dependent on him. Notice what else it means. It also means that there are times when we've got to dig into him. Times when we got to dig in. Let me show you what this means. Again, Psalm 1, verse 3. It's the tree, right? Look at verse 4. The wicked are not so, but they're like chaff that the wind drives away. You, you, it's hard to imagine a more stark contrast between a strong, mighty tree in full leaf, anchored with strong roots by a water source. Compare that to chaff that the wind drives away. The psalmist says, this is the wicked, this is the person who has no regard for God, or even worse, gives lip service to the Lord, but lives a totally different life, and in their hearts are so blackened and turned away from God, this is the wicked, they are like chaff that the wind drives away. And the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. There are times when we simply have to dig into this truth. Because there are seasons of life, circumstances of life, and if we're not careful and if we let our perspective be too um, closed in, we will begin to convince ourselves that, that may, maybe, maybe the wicked do win. Maybe the evil do prosper. Maybe the person who goes their own way, does it their own way, sets their own agenda, maybe that really is the better, smarter way because it really does seem like they're gaining everything and, and good, godly people are losing. Maybe that is the way to go. That's when you've got to dig in. Dig into the Lord. Dig your heels into the truth of God's Word because God's Word says the godly survive, that it's only for a season, God is in charge. God is sovereign. He has a purpose for everything that happens to those who love him. He will see you through. And if you trust him, you will come to understand, whether now or even in eternity, the reason why. But sometimes you just got to dig in and stubbornly, stubbornly say, God, I'm going to choose to believe in you and your truth, your purpose, and your plan. You got to dig in. And then finally, there's this. When you're in relationship with God, you can discern with him. Notice how the psalm ends. He mentions, you know, there are times when you look around and see the wicked prospering, godly people suffering. Look at verse 5. The wicked won't stand in the judgment, sinners in the congregation of the righteous. And we can ask, well, how can you be so certain? Verse 6. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Discernment. Knowledge, wisdom, understanding, this comes in time. It doesn't happen overnight. Some of the 
people that I most love being around are people that have walked with the Lord the longest because they've got the wisdom that God has shown them day after day, week, month, year after year. Wisdom does come. Understanding does come. But it comes, it comes as the Lord shows it. It comes as we persevere. It comes as we show our character in God. But yeah, discernment. Understanding why. Letting God give you wisdom. Why did that happen? Why did they say that? Why did those circumstances work out the way that they did? Why are these things happening on the global stage? But then to be still in God's presence and for his word to come through his spirit to your spirit. Say, God, thank you. You're giving me discernment and wisdom. We're going to make it and we're going to be just fine. You discern with him having a relationship with God. I want to share with you a story from, from this past week working in Cuba. And, and to me, this illustrates exactly what it means for the difference that it makes. In other words, living life, right? And, and circumstance, the, the same circumstances can happen to a person in relationship with God that can happen to a person not in relationship with God. Jesus says the rain falls on the just and the unjust. The same circumstances can happen. The question is, for the person in relationship with God, there will be an amazing, even unexplainable, supernatural blessing that the person out of fellowship with God will never know and won't even understand. Let me, let me give you a story that illustrates it. This pastor that we were with, uh, Pastor Olivier, small church, struggling church, loving, loving church, spirit-filled church, but, but, but small and struggling. They're, they're, they're trying to work on their building, so much so that in this church building, there were two restrooms for our group to use, two restrooms for the church to use. And this pastor, and, and again, understand this, we were the first group ever to come to this church. The first group, uh, I, I say from the United States, the first mission team ever from the United States to come to this church. And this pastor wanted so desperately for everything to work and everything to be good. But there was a problem. One of the toilets in one of the restrooms just didn't work. It leaked, it didn't work, it, it, just, it, just, it just wasn't, wasn't happening. And so when we got there, we we're finding out where to put our stuff, where we we're going to be, be uh, there for the week. The pastor had to apologize. He said, look, I'm so sorry. The toilet in this bathroom doesn't work. Oh, you know what? One toilet for all of us? We, we, we will adjust. We'll, we'll, we'll make this. It'll be fine. Don't worry about it, pastor. We're just glad to be here. Well, we began to talk amongst ourselves. One of our group said, you know what? Let's, let's buy this church a toilet. Let's just do it, you know. Let's just do it. This town, San Juan de los Lleras, remote, four and a half hour drive or bus ride from Havana, but we found out that there was a, a local plumbing supply store in a, in a, in a town close by where we could, we could buy what we needed. We, we, we uh, collected amongst our group, we got the money, I had to hire a driver, went to this uh, other town, got the toilet, got the, the, uh, the tools, brought it back, and then one particular morning we installed it. Think, well, you know, it's just what you do. Well, the next morning, as we are around the breakfast table, our mission team, our translator, the guy that, that put the toilet in, plus the pastor and his wife, he broke down in tears. And he, he, he said, I just want you all to know, he said, the night before you came, I tried to get that toilet to work. And I was up hour after hour trying everything that I knew. And he said, I finally had to go to bed at 1.30 in the morning because I knew you guys were coming the next day. But I was just so sorry that the toilet didn't work. And he said, here, you've given this to us. He starts crying. We start crying. I mean, at, at that point, it's just all over. But I'm saying to you, in the Lord, a set of circumstances that could be so awkward and that could turn in another direction very quickly in the Lord's hands becomes a way for brothers and sisters in Christ to express love and encouragement to each other. And he was totally floored by what we had done for him. And we're like, look, you know, it's just what we, what we did. It's, it's not that special. He said, no. He said, no. He said, God has brought you here. 
and God is using you to bless our church. The person not in a relationship with God would say, how in the world does that happen? But for those of us in relationship with God, we know what God's word says. Every circumstance, every circumstance, God works for the good of those who love him and are called according to your purpose. If you want to have a life in God where even a leaky toilet in Cuba can be used of him to bring blessing, then the invitation is for you. Psalm 1 describes a life in deep relationship with God. It's not simply calling yourself a Christian, but of being in close fellowship with God, love relationship with him to where he is an intimate part of everything that you do. It's a deeper level and a higher plane. Psalm 1, Psalm 1 is the invitation. Jesus Christ came into this world to show us what God is like. Jesus said in John chapter 5, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. No one comes to the Father except through me. And he said, when I go back to the Father, he'll send the Holy Spirit. He will come to you and you will never be alone. As the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he does, yes, to your amazement, he will show you even greater things than these. The Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. I tell you the truth, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He'll not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. Jesus said, for as the Father has life in himself, he has granted the Son to have life in himself. Psalm 1 is the invitation to a love relationship with God. Jesus Christ came to give it. And aren't you glad that we can look at Psalm 1 on the other side of the cross and the empty tomb and the resurrection? When Jesus says, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly, I came to repair the damaged relationship. I came to reconcile and bring you back to God. Psalm 1 says this is exactly what we're talking about. This is what Jesus died to give you. And the only question is, what will you decide? Will you receive this life in the Lord Jesus? Take it, have it, and be the blessed one. Father, we praise you and thank you today for Jesus, for the life that we have in him. And God, thank you for Psalms. Thank you for the gift and the treasury of this hymn book that we have in the Bible. It's not just the hymnal for the Old Testament. It's the hymnal for all of Scripture. And in the New Testament, Paul said to the church at Colossae, speak to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Lord, may the truth in Psalm 1 not brush us by even this morning. Lord, by your spirit, let it take root. And for any of us today that longs for simply the life that is blessed in you, Lord, today, may they take and receive in Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.